actually two weeks ago, and it didn't stop haunting me. Kids, you can leave. <laughs> Lisa forgot. There's a big decisions being made right now. <laughs> The question <clears throat> that was presented me two weeks ago was the question, is religion good? Is religion a good thing or a bad thing? And what kind of gives rise to the question is you'll hear um, a non-believer say something like, well, I'm very spiritual, but I'm not religious. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever pushed them to unpack that and to find out exactly what that means? Or you'll hear a Christian say something along the lines of, I love Jesus, but I don't like religion. I've probably heard more Christians say the latter than non-Christians say the former. So you're left with the idea that this thing called religion is somehow bad. There's something about religion that people bristle against, the believers and non-believers. And so, uh, I suffer something of a crisis of faith when I read in a letter by the half-brother of Jesus a definition of religion. And it's a definition of religion that is held up as being pure and undefiled and the kind of religion that the Father likes, that the Father is pleased with. So the answer to my question and the dilemma cannot possibly be that across the board, religion is bad. It is true that Jesus reserved some of his harshest critiques, words, for those who are part of the religious establishment. And it is true that it's entirely possible to be religious, at least by the world's standards and by some standards, and not know Jesus Christ. So the answer to this question must be a very nuanced question. The analysis must be very subtle. The cookies apparently were put on a very high shelf for us to reach up to if we want to enjoy their goodness. But I think they are, they are worth reaching up for. I think the question about religion for you and for me and all, for all believers needs to be answered and it needs to be answered clearly and concisely. And then if religion is something that is to be practiced by you and by me, and I would suggest that it is, a certain kind of religion, how would we test whether or not we are in fact practicing the kind of religion that the Father adores? What would the test be? Fortunately, we have James. We actually have the Apostle John who does very much the same thing. But we have James um, writing a letter to believers, to church, to the church, but also to family members and non-believers of the early church and he delves into this question and he tackles it head on. The thing about James is there is nothing subtle about him. He answers questions that we may pose to ourselves or that others may pose and where you're left with uh, something of a vague answer, uh, an answer that maybe a lawyer would try to give, James says, I'll have none of that. I'm going to give you the answer. And I'm not going to give you any wiggle room. I'm not going to give you any caveats. I'm not going to give you any footnotes or outs or any gray areas. Here's the answer to the question that you may be pondering. So to the question, is religion good? Are we to be practicing it? And if we are, what should it look like? We have the Apostle James. 
In chapter 1, verse 26, we read, If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man or woman's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of our Lord. Father, your word has been read, has been read aloud, and I pray now that you will prepare our hearts through the power of your indwelling Holy Spirit, through the power of your provenient grace, hover to and fro in our very midst, Lord, and give us ears to hear and eyes to see what it is you'd have us to know this very day about religion. In his name we pray, amen. One of the things that makes this question complicating is the word religion or religious pretty much only comes up in this little paragraph. It certainly only comes up in James' letter. So you can't really use Scripture to help interpret Scripture. You can't go elsewhere in the New Testament to get a whole lot of clarity on what this word religion even means. So you're kind of stuck with the Bible itself and then some extra biblical sources that sort of help explain it. But let me assure you that the word religion and religious are good translations of the original Greek. I don't think any of you will have translations that will have anything other than that. And that should be a sign that you can, with confidence, look at this and say, the word religion is a good translation from the original language. The word religious is a good translation. It's solid. It's interesting the word comes from sort of the idea of fear and of trembling. But as used in this context, it's looking at how we practice our faith from an outward stance. So we all know that God and God alone can judge the heart, right? Like the person to your left or your right, they may be in church 365 days out of the year, but you don't really know what their heart is about. You know what things look like outwardly. You can see some evidence and some fruit, but only God really knows what it is in the heart. This word religion is not looking at the heart as much as it's looking at one's outward practice of faith. What does one's outward practice of the faith look like? What does one do outwardly? Does one attend a worship service, for instance? Does one receive communion? Does one, has one been baptized? Does one go to a midweek Bible study? Does one do devotions in the morning? Does a, does a person pray? What outwardly would you see if you were to conclude, oh my goodness, this person is religious? But in this context, it's saying, don't look at others, look at yourself. Look at your outward practices in your own life and determine if you are religious applying God's standards. And the thing is, is our hearts are so deceptively evil, they've been so tainted by sin but the truth of the matter is, is we are not even capable of accurately determining whether our own religious practices are right and good. It is only through the Holy Spirit's conviction and clarity and only through God's coming along and nudging and steering and guiding and His words and being immersed in prayer that we even have a clue if we're on the right track. And we instinctively know this. We know that you could be outwardly the most religious person in the world. You can stand in a pulpit and preach seven days a week. You can be a district superintendent, an assistant district superintendent, a bishop, a pope. You could be a Sunday school superintendent, a board member, and you could not be in relationship with the Lord and yet still look religious. That scare anybody? 
Does that humble anybody? Because at the end of the day, each one of us, as we lay our heads down on those pillows, are probably looking to God and saying, God, I did this, I did this, I did this. Thank you that this happened. Thank you that you gave me that. Now I lay my head down to sleep, and you take off toward the next day, getting ready to be religious again. But is it the right religion? I'm not asking if it's Christianity. I'm assuming it is if you're here. What I'm asking is, is it the kind of religion that the Father adores and accepts? Is it the kind of religion that we are to be pursuing? And see, we want it to be something like this. Yes, you are to be religious, but here's the standard it shall be guided by. Number of times you have attended the church, number of times you have gone to Sunday school, how well you're dressed, how many hymns were sung this week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when we get to God's word, we find that none of those have anything to do with the metric that God applies to your testing your religion. Here we go. If anyone thinks himself to be religious. I looked up that word anyone and it means anyone. <laughs> and I tried to massage it and get it to look like something else and I found out it means me too. If anyone thinks himself to be religious. Well now many Christians in here will say I don't consider myself to be religious. I love Jesus. Stop right there. Because the Bible is actually saying there is a religion that you are to be practicing. There is a religion that is good. There is a religiosity, is that a word? That Christians are supposed to be pursuing. And we are also supposed to be checking ourselves. Anyone is supposed to be checking themselves to find out if they are, in fact, religious. But the test that God uses, the metric that He applies, has nothing to do with the outward things that most of us would have thought would have been important. It has nothing to do with how many spiritual songs we've memorized. It has nothing to do with how early we got here to church or how late we leave. It has nothing to do with whether we can pray in the King James English. It has nothing to do... You know what it has to do with? A hole in your face. Your mouth. And what comes out of it. No, anything but that. Let it be my dress code. Let it be my education. Let it be my degrees. Let it be my, my position, my title. Let it be um, my residency. Let it be how many good deeds I've done at the soup kitchen. Can it, can it be something else other than that? And the resounding immediate answer is no. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. It doesn't get any clearer than that, and I don't like that. <laughs> I need it to be more vague. I need it to, I need it to have a little bit of, bit of wiggle room in it. I need to be able to find some gray, but there's none. If anyone thinks himself or herself to be religious, well, my guess is on a good day, most of us do think ourselves to be fairly religious. We'll go down to Diamonds or we'll go to the coffee shop and before we receive our, our food, we'll pray. That's an outward sign of religion, right? But God's saying about it wouldn't really start there and it certainly wouldn't end there if your religion has any worth. No, to determine whether your religion has any worth, we have to take a look at whether your tongue is under 
control, whether my tongue is under control. Now, there's so many other temptations of the flesh. There are so many other weaknesses of the flesh. There are so many other things that pull us into the world. I wish the test could have been so many other things, things that the Lord has delivered me from. I've been sober from alcohol for 21 years. I wish that could be the test. But he delivered me from it and said, you got some work to do with your tongue. I wish it could be other things, other things that I've already gotten victory of through the grace of Jesus Christ. But the tongue, that one's tough. In fact, ask any Christian in a moment of candor how they do with controlling their tongue and they will say, Notice what he says. That the tongue is to be bridled. Now, every time I've ridden a horse, I've either gotten knocked off or thrown off. So I do not promise to be an equine specialist here. But I know enough to know that the bridle is the leather strapping that goes over the horse's head, to which you attach two things. One, the bit that goes into the horse's mouth, and secondly, the reins to help you steer. So I've, I've, I've even got that much down. It didn't help me. I still got thrown, still got kicked off. But I've got that much down. And do you know that with the bridle, a three-year-old little girl can control a 400-pound animal by going like this and like that. Because she controls the animal. She's got the animal controlled. Now, for many years, monks would cut off their tongues to try to overcome this temptation. Seriously, as a, as a, as a, a strict ascetic practice, people would cut off their tongues so that it couldn't be said that their tongues were unbridled. Guess what? Maybe they didn't have tongues, but they still practiced worthless religion. They found other ways for the language to come out, the language of their heart that deceived the the, the sin and the sin nature and the darkness. They found other ways even though they had no tongue. So it's not about cutting off your tongue and God doesn't tell you to cut off your tongue. He says, bridle it. Control it. Don't stop talking. In fact, there are instances where you must speak. Where the failure to speak can actually be the sin. But your speech, my speech, must be, in order for us to be religious, in a way that is worthful. Is that a word? I don't know why I keep looking at Pastor Ben. (laughs) Mel, is it a word? (laughs) To determine whether there's any worth to your religion, it's a matter of how controlled your tongue is. When you go this way, does your mouth say what you want it to say? When your hand goes this way, or perhaps the bride of the bit is pulled this way, does when it's pulled like this, does it stop? When there's a little snap to the reins, Does it go when it's supposed to? And are the words the kind of words that are honoring to the Lord, that are consistent with God's word? Are they truthful? Are they they encouraging? Are they the kind of words that build up? Are they the kind of words that are honest? Are they the kind of words that um, aren't slanderous, but in fact are true? Are they the kind of words that if Jesus were sitting right next to you, better yet if he were inside of you, he would be pleased to hear you utter. I got news for you, folks. He is inside each and every one of us. His Holy Spirit resides in our hearts, and he hears every single word. So how well we've got this bridal thing down is a big deal. And unfortunately, we are told that we are going to give an account We are going to give an answer, and there won't be an answer, for every careless word we've ever uttered, 
for every profanity we've ever slung out there, for every hateful word, for every word that was uttered that wasn't controlled by a bridle and by a bit, we are going to be giving an account. And brothers and sisters, that's Christians who are going to be giving that account. There's going to be a replay. There's going to be the Monday morning films for you football players. They probably don't use film now, do they? There's going to be video. There's going to be a flash drive. And every careless, mean, false, idolatrous, slanderous word that we uttered, we will be called to give an account of. So if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, the man's religion is worthless. There's a little phrase right in the middle of that that I almost wanted to skip over. He hasn't bridled his heart, but he's deceived his own heart. He hasn't bridled his own tongue, but he's deceived his own heart. See, it's very easy for us to deceive our own hearts and say, everything I said today was sanctified. Everything I said was in truth. Everything I said today, that person needed to hear. Everything I said was for her own good. Everything I said today was for the good of the church. Everything I said today was the way, the truth, and the life. It's the only way. There's... And we can deceive our own hearts. See, we are not the standard. We are not the arbiters. God is. God's word is the arbiter of what should be telling your mouth and my mouth what to say and not be saying and when to say it and when not to say it. But we are told right here that we can deceive our hearts. We can deceive ourselves into being religious. And sometimes that's what we do. We, we superimpose and we replace really, really dangerous, sinful words and mouths and tongues. We replace it with outward, religious-looking things. I'll join a committee. I'll serve on another board. I'll tell everybody about what I did for this certain person in need. I'll stand up and offer my services for this. I'll do that. I'll do that. I will look so religious. I'll be the most religious looking person in the world. And God will say, you have not bridled your tongue. Your religion is worthless and you're deceiving yourself. And that's hard for us to get a handle on, to actually go, religion isn't what I thought it was. He's giving me a test and it involves my words and my heart is so marred by sin, it's so bent in on itself that I'm capable of deceiving myself. Who's going to save me from this tongue of death? Paul would sort of say in Romans 7. Only our God can. Then he says something very interesting. Pure and unfiled religion in the sight of our God, our religion is actually seen by our God. Everything you and I said or did today, this morning, last night, the night before, has been seen by our God. Not just your God, not just your God, our God, our Father who art in heaven. Pure and undefiled religion. What kind of religion will he accept? It has to be pure and undefiled. And that is defined by the tongue. Oh, we in trouble. Here's what he says, though, and it's very interesting. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their distress. Now we must carry over from the previous verse and the context that one pure and undefiled religion 
is a bridal tongue. But he says it's not just that. Christian, you've got to be willing to get your hands dirty too. Now we look at this list and we say, oh, that's nice. Undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father. I'll forget about that tongue thing because I... But this business, oh, I'll find an orphan. Or I'll find me a widow. Then I will be religious in the sight of God. And it will be pure and undefiled. And the commentaries are absolutely consistent on this. That's not what that verse really means. That list is not even intended to be exhaustive. Widows and orphans were used because in Jesus' day, those were the ones who were the most vulnerable people. Those were the people that if somebody didn't step in and get their hands messy with, they were not going to survive. They were not going to make it in culture. They were not going to make it in society. They would die. There was no social security blanket. There, well, I guess there's no social security blanket for anybody anymore. Um, there was no uh, any kind of um, health care for them. There was no fallback where the government could help them. No, those were the most vulnerable people in the world. And God is saying, if you want to be religious and it's pure and it's undefiled, bridle your, to your tongue, watch everything you say, say only what you're supposed to say and when you're supposed to say it and the way you're supposed to say it, and don't be afraid to get your hands dirty with messy people. And these days it might not be widows and orphans. These days it may be somebody with AIDS or COVID, or somebody in prison, or somebody in a juvenile hall, or somebody who's just poor, monetarily poor, or somebody who perhaps we don't like, but somebody who requires us to go get our hands dirty with. That word there is actually the word presbyter. It's weird, it, it's, it's, it's this, it's that we are to visit, we are to presbyter orphans and widows. Presbyter is the word that we would translate, translate like bishop, district superintendent. This would be Dr. Kitzko. It can't just be given lip service. Have to really overlook that person, really get into that person's life and really get your hands dirty and can't just uh, come alongside them once or twice and say, there, my religion is done. No, what did you say when you were with him? What did you not say when you were with them? Did you care for their needs? Were you present with them? When you were in that room with them, would they have said, he listened to me? Would they have said, eh, he spent a lot of time trying to give me fixes for everything, but I don't think he heard a word I said. Pure and undefiled religion, my friends, is bridling that tongue and then getting your hands dirty with that orphan or with that widow or with that cancer patient or, or with that person in the hospital or that person who's in jail or that person who is, for whatever reason, struggling in life. It's getting your hands dirty. But without having your own soul stained from the dirt because he finishes it very clear pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this bridle that tongue keep it bridled keep it under control visit orphans and widows and those who are in distress and keep oneself unstained by the world well, Jeff, I just thought you said you have to get your hands dirty. How can you get your hands dirty with the least of these without getting stained by the world? And Jesus told us this is exactly what the call is on our lives. 
He's leaving us in the world, but we are not to be of the world. Therefore, we are to bridle ourselves, bridle our language, put the bits in our teeth, have self-control, the kind of self-control over the tongue and everything we say and we do, reach out to those and get our hands dirty with those who are the most vulnerable, but do not get stained by the world in the process. Oh, does that sound like a delicate balance? That sounds like the most delicate little dance imaginable. And on our own, we can't do it. We will fail. But the message of holiness upon which this church was founded, and might I add, upon which this very congregation was founded, I know some of the saints who have already gone to be with the Lord, who were founding, founding mothers and fathers in this church, who understood holiness, and they knew what it meant, and they knew what it meant to bridle the tongue, and they knew what it meant to go out there and get your hands dirty, but do it in a way such that you did not get stained by the world. We're called to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Asking him to cleanse our heart so that we can be religious in the way that God loves. In a way that God adores. In a way that brings us into the sanctuary on a Sunday, giving him praise and giving, exalting his name because he has enabled us to pull off the impossible. Our words our speech has been loving and truthful. It hasn't been defamatory, but it has encouraged and it has built up. It hasn't been coarse joking. It hasn't been coarse language. And if we've slipped up from time to time, the reins and the bit, they grab right away and they get back on control, getting us back on the path. The Holy Spirit will do that and wants to do that. And the Holy Spirit wants to put us in communication with and in fellowship with people who are the least of these. Jesus says it in Matthew 25. James himself is reiterating the same thing. Are we engaging while controlling, while being self-controlled, the least of these who need us to get our hands dirty with them? And would we be willing to trust the God that sends us to these folks to keep our hands and our feet and our mouths unstained by the world? You know what the world is? It's Satan's sin system. That's a lot of S's, isn't it? It actually was in our order of service this morning. It is Satan's sin system. It's not that the creation around us is bad. God made it and looked at it and said, oh, this is good. And every day he added something more to it. He said, this is good. And when he got to us, he said, this is very, very good. So that's not what he's talking about when he says, don't get stained by the world. What he's saying is, look, Satan has been given dominion for a short period of time. The victory is already our Lord's, but he is here, he is roaming, he is trying the same old tricks, which usually involve tricks of the mouth. Things like lies, things like deception, things like slander, things like, oh, you don't need to take care of that person, someone else will. You don't need to worry about that person, somebody else will. And all the time, all the time, God is saying, oh no, right of your tongue, I'll help you. Help those people, and I will help you to stay unstained in the process. The Thanksgiving that I'm recalling was in the 70s. And I was not a Christian. But my dad got an idea that he wanted to teach me a lesson about how fortunate we are here in our country, how fortunate we are. And he says, uh, you and I are going to deliver um, 
along with a lady down in Detroit. We're going to deliver bags of Thanksgiving meals. Now, I said, where's that going to be? Where in downtown Rochester Hills will we be doing this? <laughs> and he said, no, it's not going to be Rochester Hills. I said, well, obviously, Gross Point then. No, not there. It's, it's, it's going to be in Detroit. And it's not going to be in a nice area of Detroit. And I said, well, Dad, you never go to Detroit. I mean, what, it doesn't matter. We're going we're gonna to go with Mary. Mary knows her way around. Mary knows God. Mary knows people and situations. And so we drove down there. I figured we'd have to drive Mary down there just to protect her. We drove down there. Mary, all of like 5'1", maybe on a good day, is standing outside of her car waiting for us, kind of doing one of these. She says, let's go. We got about 18 bags. Now, I am in the middle of a ghetto like I have never been in. It was right around those years where arson was taking place all the time. The Detroit Fire Department had some of the best firefighters in the world because homes were being lit up every single night. And so subdivisions looked more like a bombed out Beirut in some areas. Well, that's exactly where Mary had us going. And Mary says, let's give these people a thanksgiving. They don't have anything, as you're soon going to find out. Let's show them the love of God. Let's get our hands dirty. And I'm thinking the whole time, I'm going to get stained by this world. I'm not even a Christian. I'm probably the one who's going to stain everything and everybody around. But off she, she took off with the big bag over her shoulder and her compression stockings, marching down that little street, and she went to this house. I didn't even know it was occupied. She went into that house. She walked right in. Darlene, are you here? Dar, are you here? And there they were, sitting around a 55-gallon barrel in the middle of the living room with wood and furniture and paper burning so they could just stay warm. And she says, Happy Thanksgiving. God loves you. That tongue was bridled from the beginning to the end. She visited the most vulnerable, the least of these, those who needed to see God the most. And she left with a blessing. She prayed for that house. And it wasn't this convoluted doxology. It was just a simple prayer. And my dad and I, I'm sure if you had seen a picture, our jaws would have been on the ground. She said, okay, let's go. Next house. Heads on down there. Now those compression stockings are starting to droop a little bit. She grabs another bag, walks into another house that I could not possibly. I learned more about God, about a bridled tongue, about true and undefiled religion, and about being kept free from the stains of the world. In an hour and a half that Thanksgiving than I ever have in my life. Mary was religious. She was religious from her tongue to her hands to her compression stockings. The answer, my friends, is we are to be religious. We are to be religious. It's to be an authentic religion, not hypocritical, not impure, but pure, not dirty, but instead undefiled. It begins and it ends here. And in the practice of that religion, it involves getting these dirty, getting into lives that are messy. And actually getting invested instead of just saying, I'll send a check. And it involves doing all of that and in the process, 
being in the world, but not of it. That is my prayer for us. That's my prayer for the church. That is my prayer for the big church with the capital C. If the world sees pure and undefiled Christian authentic religion, the kingdom won't just be in heaven. It'll be here on earth where his will will be done. Pray with me. Father, we thank you and we give you praise for calling us to a life of religion, a very special kind of religion that involves our words, our language. It involves our hands. It involves our hearts that are so easily deceived. Speak to these hearts. Show us how to control the bridle and the bit. Show us where the hands are needed. Show us all of these things so that we may practice a religion that makes you not only proud of us, but that is worthy of celebration and it draws us deeper, deeper into a walk with you and more and more into Christ-likeness tomorrow than today and next week than this week. And protect us from Satan's sin system. He so eagerly wants to devour us. But we know the victory has been had in Jesus Christ. Oh, the blood, oh, the body that was pierced for us, which we celebrated today in Holy Communion. Take all of this and move it from our ears to our hearts and transform us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, you are not only dismissed, but you are loved. Take care.